Hello, welcome to Hacker Practice, the show where I practice the art of conversation with hackers. Today's guest is a genius level engineer and computer scientist. He got his PhD from MIT with a focus on planning for autonomous systems. And he also holds degrees, other degrees, in techniques for improving software reliability, aeronautic and astronautics, electrical engineering, and computer science, all from MIT. So he's a very highly educated person, if you couldn't tell already. Now, he's not just a learner. He's also a doer. His work experience includes time at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab, Draper Labs, Northrop Grumman, Pratt & Whitney, Boeing, and DARPA. DARPA is the organization that invented the internet, by the way, in case you didn't know. So at MIT, he also helped teach a variety of courses, including one in principles of autonomy and decision making. So we're going to talk in this conversation a lot about artificial intelligence and technology and learning technical skills. So if you can follow along, if you're interested in those subjects, you're going to get a lot out of it. Now, since graduating, our guest has started a new kind of school. He's trying to revolutionize education as we know it. This school has no classes, no subjects, no courses, no grades. In other words, it's a completely new model of education. So a good chunk of our conversation today is devoted to educational methodologies and the state of education in the United States and in the world today. Our guest today is none other than David Wang, the intellectual powerhouse, the AI genius. I'm so glad to have him on the show. I hope you all enjoy today's conversation with David Wang. Welcome to the show, David. How are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad that you could be here. Do you remember, we met maybe early last year. Do you remember how we met or anything about our initial conversations? <laughs> I remember that um, I was introduced to you by our common friend, Naf Visser, who was um, helping my school develop our website. Um, I think we met at a local, um, was, was it Life Alive? It was Life Alive. I think yeah. I was late. <laughs> yeah. And we had a good conversation on artificial intelligence. And I believe you were working on a different project at the time. Yeah, I am notorious for having many side projects at one time. So at that time, I was running the innovation department at one of the fastest growing tech agencies in Boston. And I had this side project where I was trying to build just chatbot platforms uh, using, you know, just typical web application software. And it's still kind of, yeah, it's still on the back burner. It kind of took the sideline to a, a nut butter company that Knopf really encouraged me to to explore. So now I'm 100% focused on a podcast and 100% focused on this conversation with you. I'm curious, what, uh, so we were talking about AI. You've got a huge background in AI. It's kind of your bread and butter. Talk, talk to me. What's been on your mind with AI lately? Um, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. So art, artificial intelligence has gone through this crazy evolution that people kind of don't remember anymore. And we're kind of on the uptick now. Um, so when artificial intelligence was first formulated a little bit more than 50 years ago now, um, you know, people thought that it would be this game-changing thing that in the next five or ten years, and mind you, this was 50 years ago, would immediately revolutionize the world. And then a lot of people forget that um, there were a lot of broken promises. So um, people thought we could immediately do things with artificial intelligence, but um, it ends up that it was an early field in which there wasn't um, a lot of known things about how AI works. Um, and so a lot of the promises couldn't be fulfilled and funding really fell and it kind of disappeared. And for a while there's something, for a while there was something that we call it the AI winter in which um, lots of people really didn't want to fund artificial intelligence research. And you know, now we're at this time in which artificial intelligence has been climbing popularity again. And I think it's really interesting that um, now there's this interesting discussion about whether artificial intelligence could be bad for the world. Um, at the same time, there are companies uh, forecasting that artificial intelligence is the new user interface, um, that personal assistance and our ability to interact with machines to service basic things that we, questions we might have, basic needs that we might have, mm -hmm. is the wave of the future. 
So I think it's really interesting that there are kind of these different uh, forms of thought, and it's fantastic to see the popularity of artificial intelligence resurging. So you're excited to see the popularity. What what do you think about the sort of doomsday scenario versus the the real application that's actually going to? How is it really going to unfold in your eyes? Um, you know, so it's actually really interesting. So um, it's interesting that science informs popular culture and popular culture informs science. Um, so, uh, I mean, Elon Musk was very concerned about what artificial intelligence would mean for the future of humanity, questioning whether we would have like AI overlords. Um, it's actually really interesting that all these issues have been brought up because there's actually a, a new kind of budding field in AI research about uh, um, ethics and morality and how exactly do you represent these concepts to a computer and how do you get them to obey by human notions of morality and ethics. Um, so I, th I think it's great that these concerns have been brought up because it really forces us to think about them. And these are questions that um, might not have been sexy in the past, but are sexy now because it's an important topic of discussion. So, so you're an expert in this. Can you, I mean, just talk to me a little bit about your background in AI so everybody understands exactly how uh, serious you are about this field. Right. So, I, so it's kind of interesting. So I got into artificial intelligence because um, I was interested in codifying algorithms. So algorithms was actually my, my passion. Um, so, you know, an algorithm is just basically a recipe. It's a, it's a sequence of steps you do to get something done. And what I realized in learning about algorithms is even some of the mo most mundane tasks we can do, we can come with very clever ways of doing them efficiently. And artificial intelligence is just taking those algorithms and making them do human level tasks that we think only human can do and to do them efficiently. Um, so my background in artificial intelligence, um, actually really started, well, it's actually kind of interesting to answer. So um, I think I should say I, I started with a uh, passion in doing everything. Um, so just to, to take the story back a little farther in time. So when I first came to MIT, I enrolled in the aeronautics and astronautics department because I wanted to learn a little bit about everything. And AeroAstro seemed the best way to do that. I could learn about fluid dynamics and structures and a little bit of programming. Um, everything needed to get a plane to fly or a rocket into outer space. And I thought that was a fantastic thing. Um, after a while, though, I learned that um, to really make something fly in AeroAstro, a lot of the fundamental principles and equations um, that you learn in your undergraduate years um, aren't necessarily actually used to build a plane. They're more like guiding principles. What, Nowadays, what? we use advanced supercomputers to simulate a lot of the complex fluid dynamics that are involved in figuring out whether a rocket or a plane will fly. So then I was wondering, well, what else could I do? And so I turned to my hobby. So for anyone out there trying to figure out what to do with the rest of your life, um, a good tip would be to think about how your hobby might turn into a job. So um, my hobby was actually tinkering with computers. So I entered the field of electrical engineering computer science, and I decided to get a bachelor's in that in MIT, and it ends up that's where I really found my passion. Um, so again, can I, I interrupt really you for a second and just ask one question? Absolutely. Because you say you like tinkering with computers. Tell me, what does that actually look like in practice? Because I think you know, to some people, tinkering with computers might be, uh, you know, installing the latest flash driver in nineteen ninety eight, and you know, <laughs> your version might be a little bit different. <laughs> Yeah, my, my, my version is definitely building a computer from scratch. <laughs> okay. And there when was, you say from scratch, was, do you mean like buying a GPU from Micro Center and buying your power supply and buying the tower and putting it all together? Or do you mean like, no, I'm going to build the parts and put them together? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. So most of my time, I bought the parts and put it together. Um, but just for the fun of it, after I took a basic electrical engineering course, in which I learned how a processor worked, I just built a processor from basic logic gates. It's a huge, huge thing. Wait, um, <laughs> you built your own processor from logic gates. What did this process look like? Um, it was a huge prototyping board. Um, probably, I don't know, there was a bunch of little ones, but I palisaded like two meters by two meters with tons of little logic gates on it. And, um, and it was a very basic, like, four-bit processor. So nothing like what we have today, a 64-bit processor. 
Um, but it could add, divide, multiply, subtract, branch, the basic operations you would expect from a, from a, a simple processor. And, and so you had the components, you stuck them into a breadboard and the correct configuration. Did, did you take it anywhere after that? How long did the whole process take you? That whole process was kind of a, a hobby I did. So I was a, still a student at the time. So I did this in my spare time. Um, I don't know, after school, probably a couple months. <laughs> and and then do you still have that processor lying around? I do oh, not. No. I've actually harvested it for parts. I use those logic gates in my students' projects nowadays. Nice. So <laughs> you, you were a tinkerer. You were building computers uh, from scratch using parts off the shelf. Then eventually one day you built your own processor. You're still at MIT. What happens next? Um, right. So what happens next? So um, yeah, I like to tell people that I stayed at MIT. So I've been at MIT since 2001. Um, I like to tell people I decided to stay at MIT for my master's and PhD because I was too lazy to go anywhere else. Um, it happens when I finished my uh, two bachelor's degrees. Um, uh, There's a professor I had been working with uh, named Professor Lundquist at the time who asked me, you know, would you like to, to be a graduate student in my lab? Um, and her lab worked on was called in the Embedded Systems Laboratory, and it worked on safety critical avionics flight systems. So designing new languages to guarantee that these that these um, programs that people's lives depend on work kind of out, right out of the box the first time you run it. Um, so you know she asked me, and she was like, "There's funding in it for you," and I was like, "Okay, great, sure, I'll do that. That sounds interesting." Um, so this so opportunity it, falls into your lap, essentially. Yeah, yeah, it, it really does. Um, so, you know, at that time, I was just jumping this gap. So I knew I really liked working with computers. I knew I had a passion for learning about algorithms um, because of some of the undergraduate courses I'd taken. And this professor asked me if I wanted to do this. And, you know, I think that's when I really got my first taste of um, what I wanted to do. And to answer that, to, say, to describe that a little bit more specifically, I found out that there, when it comes to working on algorithms, um, an algorithm is just a recipe to get you somewhere, but you still have to answer the question, where are you ultimately going with that? Mm -hmm. And while I found working in that master's, doing that master's degree interesting, it wasn't ultimately what I was passionate about. Um, I was really interested in thinking about how we could make human reasoning processes more efficient. Um, so I finished up the master's dutifully, um, but then it happened that as I was finishing my master's, I was approached by another professor uh, named Brian Williams at the MIT Computer Science and AI Lab, or CSAIL for short. Um, you know, and he asked me if I wanted to be in his lab because he had some funding and he had a project that could, he could use my help on. So, you know, uh, being lazy and not interviewing anywhere else, I was like, yeah, sure. That so sounds even better. I, I, I'm going to interrupt you a few times because I've got all these questions I want to ask. But I'm curious, like, was there a point during your education, probably around, you know, getting your, going from your master's to your PhD, where you realized, holy crap, there is nobody in the world who knows more about X, Y, and Z than me. Yes. I, th I felt that a little bit during my master's degree, but I definitely felt that during my PhD. How does that Which, feel? How does it feel? Yeah. Um, you know, that's interesting. I think... I think everyone plays a unique role in their jobs, and oftentimes when you're doing these things, you don't forget about how important other people might find it. I mean, to me at the time, it was a job. I, I loved doing it, but I really didn't think about how cool other people might find it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I worked on all sorts of crazy projects with you know, DARPA. Um, I don't know. I've worked with autonomous underwater vehicles before. And it's all cool stuff, but in the moment, I'm just trying to get the get it done to get something working. For, for and, people who don't know, can, can you tell us what DARPA is? Um, so DARPA is an advanced research project agency of the Defense Department. Um, so they and, fund various um, advanced military projects. Um, some people might know DARPA as ARPA, um, and ARPA, before the D was prepended to it, um, is probably most famous for inventing the internet of all things. Um, so ARPA provided a lot of funding for the internet as we now know it, mm -hmm. um, and they continue to um, they continue to I don't know revolutionize research 
budding technologies. Um, so they work on all sorts of crazy projects, super soldier type projects, um, um, advanced flight systems, cybersecurity problems. Um, so they do a lot of really interesting groundbreaking research. So at around this time, you know, you're getting your PhD, you go to CSAIL to work with Brian Williams. What, what are you learning at this point? So I, I would have to say during my entire college career, this is the time that I actually felt most at home. Um, so I was learning things that I, I thought were very interesting. Um, so the, my PhD is in a subfield of artificial intelligence called automated planning and scheduling. Um, and I would say this is what's really nice about this task is it's easy to describe to a human because it's something we do all the time. So just like you might say you need to plan out your day or schedule activities for your day, that's exactly what we want a computer to do. We want a computer to figure out, given the state of the world as it is now and where you want to be eight hours from now, um, we want the computer to figure out what actions to take to get you from where you are now to where you want to be. Um, so I think it's incredibly intuitive to describe to a human, but what I found most interesting is after that intuitive explanation, you now have to describe it to a computer. Mm -hmm. And a computer doesn't get things intuitively. A computer needs things broken down. And so how you break things down, how you reason over it, all has to be picked apart. And so it's an it's a interesting way of thinking about um, how humans think about things. Um, because normally when you say you're going to plan or schedule your day, you don't really think about all the little considerations. Um, you don't have them well categorized. But when you have to represent things to a computer, you need things very well thought through. And so in a way, is doing artificial intelligence research, um, I don't know if it necessarily teaches me how the human brain works, but it teaches me one possible way of representing what's going on inside of our heads. So can you, can you break, me, break it down for me, what this looked like in practice? You're writing algorithms for automated planning and scheduling. What are some of the constituent elements of an algorithm in this field? Um, sure. So actually, let me describe the general problem first, and then I, I can give you a better idea of how the algorithm works. Sure. Uh, so how would we describe the world to a computer? Um, so in, in the, when it comes to planning and scheduling research, we describe them in terms of true and false statements. So you can say a coffee cup is on a table, you can say the table is on the ground, um, you know, and each one of these statements is true or false. You know, is the table standing on the ground? Is the table tipped over true or false? Um, so you can, you can imagine that describing a world this way, you might have to say millions and millions of things, but that's fine. A computer is fine representing the world as millions and millions of true and false statements. It's good at that. So let's say we describe the world with all of these true and false statements. So then we have a language with which we can express the world as it is now and the world as we want it to be. So you don't have to say everything about the world. You just have to describe enough of it. So um, you just have to describe all the components you want to interact with. And then after describing the world as it is now and the world as you want it to be, which we call the goal, um, you need to tell the computer what actions it could take. And an action is a very simple concept here as well. So an action has a name, so running, walking, picking something up. Um, it also has a precondition and an effect. So a precondition is just a set of true or false statements that say what needs to be true or false about the world as it is right now for you to carry out this action. So for example, if you're going to pick up a cup, you had better make sure there is a cup somewhere you know, that you can even pick up. So these are preconditions. And then an effect is just the set of statements that will become true um, or false as a result of executing that action. So an action is just a name, a set of pre preconditions, and a set of effects. And ultimately, it's the job of a planning of a planner to figure out how to sequence these actions to modify the world to get from your starting point to your goal. Um, and it can be, so what I've described is called classical planning, it's the most basic, simple problem, but it could be a lot richer. So if you think of an action in terms of what needs to be true now and what needs to be true after the action's done, you can also think about what other things are important for your actions. Maybe your action takes time, so you can add in the notion of time. Maybe your actions don't always result in the effects you wanted. So maybe instead of just saying the action has one effect, 
maybe you say 80% of the time the action results in this, maybe 20% of the time it results in something else. Um, so for example, if you go out for a walk, maybe 80% of the time you'll wander, you'll wander around the park and you'll end up back home, but maybe 20% of the time you'll wander outside, you'll bump into a friend and something else will happen. Um, so it's kind of interesting to, once you describe the world this way, it's really broken down into its component parts. Um, the algorithm, to get back to your original question, that plans this task um, is fundamentally doing a search. So um, that basically, um, in the most naive sense, is basically saying, this is the world I have right now. I'm going to try, I'm going to try simulating every possible action that I could do, and I'll see where that gets me. And then wherever it gets me next, I'm going to try all the actions again and see where that gets me. And eventually, all, after simulating these millions and millions and millions of possibilities, there must be one of them, one of these paths that gets you to where you want to go. And then that's the plan, that trajectory from um, where you started to your goal, that's the plan you would execute. So, so you have an environment created for the agent. You have... Uh, a set of actions, each action having preconditions necessary for the action to take place and effects of, of the action taking place. And right. essentially, you say, okay, here's your environment. Here's where you want the environment to be. Now, try every possibility until you find uh, a set of actions that gets you with the result that you're looking for. Yeah, exactly. Okay, and so what does are you pro, you're programming this? I imagine you're probably doing it for like a robot. What were you working on uh, in, at MIT that you were actually applying this to? Well, that is a great question. Um, so uh, this type of algorithm can also be thought of as a decision making um, style algorithm. So we applied it in lots of different places. Um, so you might hear the word planning in another context. So most commonly, we hear the word planning when it applies to path planning. Um, so for example, one simple thing that you could do with a planner is to do some sort of path planning activity to figure out how to get you from A to B. So for those of you that use Google Maps um, or any sort of Garmin GPS system like that, um, you're already familiar with a path planner. It figures out the roads you have to take in order to get you from one place to another place. Um, so you can think of each one of those little road segments that you're taking as an action. Um, you will need to drive along that road, drive along another road. So that's an example of a planner. Um, but specifically, the work I did applied in lots of different places. Um, we used it as um, uh, something for a robotic arm in a manufacturing uh, demonstration for Boeing. Um, uh, we tried using it as um, actually very interesting in a DARPA cybersecurity program to try to plan around attacks. So if someone's actively attacking a system, um, is there a way you can reconfigure the, your server or your computer to make it less likely um, for that person to, for that hacker, that, that evildoer, um, to get the information they're looking for? Um, could that be done uh, in reverse? Could the hacker create one of these systems to test every possible scenario to gain entry? It could, yep. Have you studied that at all, or is that a, a curiosity of yours? Um, you know, it's interesting. So I haven't studied that in particular, but I know there are people that definitely study that type of um, that type of stuff. It's actually really interesting how hackers work. Um, they really have a very intimate knowledge of the system. And so um, it's describing everything they know to a computer. It can actually be incredibly difficult. Um, so there are kind of two different hackers that we're concerned with. Um, one type of hacker um, goes online and just buys hacking software and uses off-the-shelf techniques. So those we can easily plan for because we already know um, what techniques are out there, what actions are available for hackers to take. The hackers that are most dangerous, though, are the ones that we can't predict, that themselves know in so many intimate details about how computers work that they can intuit or create new ways of attacking a computer. Um, and that's hard, of course. It's hard to describe to a computer these new and, these new and fascinating ways of attacking a computer. Um, when someone hasn't invented it yet. 
Um, so it's very challenging to come up with a planning system that intuits or comes up with new hacking techniques. Right, because it's a, it's really a creative endeavor. You have to originate something that hasn't previously existed, and computers are very bad at that in a lot of cases. Exactly. Okay. So you're you're researching. You were researching. You know, path planning. Uh, you were in the middle of a story, and we digressed. Is there? There's more to it. Talk me through it. Um. <laughs> wait. What story was I in the middle of? I can't remember. So you're studying. You know, this idea of you're creating algorithms where you've got these different preconditions uh, or actions with preconditions effects, and you're doing path planning. You build a robotic arm. Um, for Boeing. What was that about? What if you can share? Oh yeah. Um. So that's actually that's a kind of an interesting project, an interesting problem that um, lots of people kind of probably don't realize. Um, so uh, nowadays, a lot of the really large objects we use, cars and planes, um, even motorcycles, um, they're built on these large automated factory floors. Um, but the level of automation in these factory floors, while it looks impressively sophisticated, um, the all the robotic arms are carrying out very routine tasks. So pick something up, place it here, pick something else up, place it here. And so it's a very routine task. Um, for Boeing, we were interested in doing something a little bit more flexible. Um, so the issue was um, when you're working on really large planes, sometimes things come up, sometimes something wasn't made exactly the way you expected, maybe a bolt was missing or a bolt was added, or something wasn't cut down exactly right. Of course, planes have to be made to exact, exacting precision. So you can't just take a part that for which there was um, some human error in making it or maybe even some machine error in making it and just stick it on the plane and call it a day. You have to fix that part. Um, but that part could be the tail assembly or wing. It's enormous. Um, so we're interested in creating robotic systems that help um, repair these large, complex components on planes. Um, and having these systems interoperate with humans. Um, so sometimes a human dex dexterous hands um, is just what's needed to get the part repaired. So then the role of the robot isn't necessarily fixing the part itself, it's helping out the human. So holding the tail assembly in just the right position so the human can get access to something or trying to predict what the human is about to do um, to get the part for the human. Um, so that was the project with Boeing we're doing. It was to help out their manufacturing procedure. So, and what does that AI look like? And what was your role on the team? Um, right. So the AI for that system. So, um, so that was actually a very different use of planning and scheduling. Um, so the well, we used planning and scheduling in kind of two different ways there. Um, one of the, the most obvious ways we used it is if we knew what the human was trying to get done, then the human could just state the goal, you know, I need this thing inserted there, and the robot would figure out it would need to pick up the part, insert it there, screw it in, um, use whatever different tools were needed to attach the parts to each other, then that would be a very straightforward way of doing it. And, and, the, and the way that that is done is the robot has a bunch of pre-programmed actions with preconditions and effects, and it's basically trying every option in a simulation beforehand and then saying, oh, this is the one that works. Let me get, go ahead and do it. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. And does this happen in real life? Is Boeing using technology like this? Um, you know, I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure if they have deployed technology like this yet. They're certainly very keen on it. And if they are not using it yet, I imagine they will be soon. Um, but sorry, can't answer that question. No worries. For you. Uh, so we've been talking about planning and scheduling. Can you just give us a little bit of context? What other kinds of AIs might we run into? Ah, so I, the field of artificial intelligence has, there's a lot of subfields to it, and people are always inventing new ones. I mean, it's broad if you think about it. AI, lots of people interpret it to mean recreating human abilities or you know things that you'd expect a human could do. So there's a lot of different things out there. There's a lot of um, subfields that we attribute to AI. Um, so there's machine learning, um, and there's a lot of I don't know. There's a lot of areas of research in machine learning that are different. You might have heard of neural networks before, mm -hmm. or recommender systems such as Netflix tries to recommend 
the new videos, new movies that you should watch. Um, there's another subfield of AI called uh, machine vision. So um, how can we get computers to see things um, that you know we take for granted? You know, a huge amount of our brain is used for seeing the world around us and understanding what the objects are, what they can do. So how do you get a computer to do that same thing? Um, there's also really interesting research going on in um, programming and compiler design. So um, a lot of people, uh, a lot of us computer scientists um, take it for granted that the way you program things is with C++ and with Java, and you spend you know years and years writing pages and pages of code that details specifically how every little bit of your computer needs to do its job. But wouldn't it be cool if um, you could just tell your computer, I really need this thing connected to that thing figure out how to do it and generate the code for me. And that's being worked on right now. Where do I learn more about, what is this field of you know, programming compiler AIs? What is that even called? Where do I find this? Um, so it's, yeah, it's curious. So automated programming might be a good way to look at it or goal-directed programming. And uh, what have you seen in that field lately that makes it interesting to you? Or is there work that being done by someone or some organization that we should um, look at? So, so unfortunately, I don't know the names of any professors actively doing that research. So sorry about that. No worries. But what I find interesting about this field is, um, well, let me let me digress a little bit. So sure. what I find interesting about this field is when the when Fortran and C++ were invented as programming languages, there was actually a lot of active research in coming up with new and creative ways to program things. Um, but it just happened that C++ won out the war and everyone learned C++ and suddenly, you know, everyone knew how to program everything in C++, but then people were like, oh, C++ isn't a good enough language, so let's evolve C++. So no one has really done any really big paradigm shift in how we program things. We just, you know, keep evolving and evolving what we have now. Um, so I think what's really interesting about this new programming research is it's, it is a paradigm shift in how we've been doing things and what people take for granted. And that's always exciting. Um, but on a more fundamental level, uh, programming sucks. Um, a lot of the time there is a little bit of intelligence behind it. Maybe like 5% of the time I come up with something clever and I, and I program it. But the other 95% of the time, I am writing some boilerplate code just because if I don't write it that way, the computer won't understand it because I need a semicolon there or squiggly bracket there or need to be organized this particular way. You know, but this is all very routine things that should, in theory, be able to be done by a computer, but we just don't have a system like that yet. So let me ask you this. I, you know, you started. <clears throat> well, first of all, when did you start programming? Did you start programming after you went to MIT, or have you been programming your whole life? Uh, I, <laughs> uh, it's interesting. I probably well, the earliest memory I have of doing any sequential thing is with Logo the Turtle when I was in elementary school. Um, I don't know if you know what that is. I don't. It's, uh, <laughs> It was it was popularly distributed, but it didn't last for very long. It was um, so imagine computers at this time, you know, had if it had like if it had maybe a one gigabyte hard drive, it was an amazing computer with mm. a superior computer. Screens were all green. There was no colored screens. Um, so this was like the the caveman, the time of caveman, basically. Um, <laughs> And Logo was a very simple drawing program in which there was a little green triangle that was called Logo the Turtle. And you told Logo to go forward and uh, make a circle uh, to turn left and to turn right. And you could tell Logo the Turtle to drop its tail or raise its tail, effectively lowering a pen onto the um, screen of the computer and drawing a line behind it. Um, so that's a very early of taste of programming that I got. But I have to say I really dived into programming um, probably during middle school. Um, yeah, so I've been at it for a while. 
what were some of the things that you were doing like at a young age? I mean, what like there's usually some sort of practical application or hack that you're trying to figure out, and that's when you know you program something. What were you doing specifically at that age to to get you to program? Program. Um, huh. So I can answer that question in two different ways. So um, one, I, I think I just I loved the idea that I could get. I could have a computer do things for me, that I could write a set of instructions and have the computer churn through it and figure out answers for me. So one of the earliest things I did with a computer was, um, so I learned C++ and I programmed the computer to do my physics homework for me. So I would basically enter in equations and it would run through Euler's method to try to figure out answers for me. So I used it as a double check for um, the pencil and paper work I was actually doing. So that was one thing um, that motivated me to really learn programming. The other thing was video games. Mm. Uh, so Go on. <laughs> I am a gamer. Um, I had a, an original Atari set when I was a kid, and eventually I upgraded to a Super Nintendo, and I remember playing the game Star Fox on it. And... Um, so Star Fox was, for the Super Nintendo is very cool because it was a 3D game in a time when most games were 2D platformers. And you got to fly your, your futuristic space fighter um, in kind of into the computer screen. So you're looking at the back at the exhaust of your plane. You're flying it into this 3D world and shooting down enemies. And it was really revolutionary at the time when most games were in 2D. And I wanted to make that for myself. So... I spent a lot of time trying to recreate Star Fox from scratch. So um, I, I didn't use any graphics library or anything. I didn't use any graphics library beyond drawing primitive triangles and circles and rectangles. And I recreated this entire 3D world, which, by the way, it was very interesting and I learned a lot from it. But boy, there are so many more efficient ways to do that nowadays. Um, but I thought it was yeah. just really interesting to figure out how you could um, you could recreate these virtual worlds that look like they're real, um, but it was all done through all these numbers and equations and math. That's it's, it's just um, it's a it's a disconnect that people don't realize that there's so much math and so much thought behind the world around us nowadays. I'm I, fascinated I by this. About it. Because I also was a gamer growing up. I took a break maybe like in college because I thought that it was useless. But now, especially being someone who programs pretty much all the time, I'm just – I think it's the most important thing in the world because it inspires so many people to look into the technology. And you're absolutely right. There are more efficient ways to build 3D worlds now. Um, oh. <laughs> at the time that you were building this 3D world, that was – pretty cutting edge i think i mean what when did doom come out because doom was like really the was one of the also one of the first 3d games oh was, yeah boy i do not remember this is even before my time <laughs> I, I i do remember playing doom when i was a little kid and i remember being freaked out by it i'm still freaked <laughs> out by it <laughs> so I, I want to dig into something here because you said something where you, you said I wanted to learn you know everything or I had passion for doing everything and I get scolded by a lot of smart people who tell me I need to focus on one thing. Do you think that's true? Are you do you consider yourself a specialist? Do you think that specializing and really focusing on one thing is good for your career or good for your education? Ooh. Ooh, interesting, interesting question. Um, you, you know, there's that saying, you can do anything. Um, I like to preface, I like to add to that, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. At least you can't do everything well. Um, I think, you know, so it, this, answering this question is a little tricky. There's, um, so I, I like to think of myself as a renaissance man. I do a little bit of everything. Um, I'm not a very good cook, unfortunately, um, but I did Habitat for Humanity for a really long time, and I learned how to build houses and raise walls and all that stuff. So I can do all that stuff. I can program a computer. I'm really good at making stuff. Um, so, yeah, I really liked doing a little bit of everything. But 
kind of the interesting uh, thing I've learned now that I'm an adult um, doing a job is knowing everything is really great if the company is small um, because you have a chance to help out in all of these different areas. Um, but I know in a lot of large companies now, they're looking for a very specific specialized skill set. So you are hired to do a particular circuit design job or programming task or a marketing job, you know, and really um, your expertise in that particular area is what they need because they have a thousand people and, you know, there's one, there's at least one person for every job they could possibly that, you know, that they could have. So they really need you to excel in that one area. So I think um, for your personal edification that it's really great to know a little bit of everything. Um, I think knowing a little bit of a lot of different things um, can really help your creativity and really help your problem solving abilities because you have this wealth of knowledge you can draw upon. And I think that's really invaluable. Um, but there is definitely a balance here between the breadth of knowledge that you should get versus the specificity of knowledge you might need for being an adult and holding down a job that um, pays well. <laughs> so I, I want to continue down this path a little bit because um, one of my main reasons for doing this podcast is to learn from smart people. You're an incredibly smart person. And you're also extremely good at learning. Have you developed any strategies or tactics around learning that you think were turning points for you in terms of, oh, I am now able to pick up new skills faster because I know this? Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, I'll tell you, I don't know if this will answer your question on the nose, but, um, I learned early on that I was told to memorize a lot of facts for a lot of things and that's fine. Memorizing facts. I don't find that I didn't never found that too difficult. What I found that was much more useful in learning things was asking why something is the way it is. So getting the intuition behind something, I think, is much more valuable. Um, so um, in, in, in history class, for example, um, learning about, you know, uh, various presidential administrations and the dates they came into the office. I mean, that's great. You can memorize those facts. I really don't know how useful that would be in the future, but maybe what's useful is that intuition behind why there was some policy put in place. Um, uh, I don't know why McCarthyism occurred, for example. So understanding the reasons behind something, um, I think is a much more useful thing. And so nowadays when I learn anything new, I always try to ask that question. Why is it that way? Is there some intuition I can extract from it? Um, that will make it uh, easier for me to remember and make it more applicable to other things. What are, well, I have, I have two questions, but I want to ask you this one first. What are you learning about these days? Like, what are you focusing on? What's the last why that you asked? Ah, um, okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, so a, a side project I recently picked up is um, working on new smart home technologies and um, it might not be obvious quite yet if you haven't been, if you're not an early technology adopter, but um, people are predicting that augmented reality is the wave of the future. Um, so that ability to see the world through a camera or potentially through go goggles or glasses and see some digital display of information or some modified representation of the world displayed over it. Um, so um, I was asking, my, asking myself, um, why is this technology useful? Um, so, you know, augmented reality, lots of people see it as kind of a fun gaming thing. So I can see a T-Rex stomping through my house. Um, but what could it actually, how could it actually help people? And Remembering uh, names. What's that? Remembering names. I feel what's like... That? It would be yeah. awesome if you're going to a cocktail party and you've got on your Google Glasses or whatever you know the new AR technology is, and it sees somebody and it says that's a face, and then it looks through LinkedIn and Facebook and every database online for that face, and then it says that person's name is X, and then you never have to remember a name again. Yes, <laughs> oh, man, I would love that. I'm so bad at remembering names. It's one. It's part of my brain that I wish we had developed better. 
But man, that's pretty. Do rough. you want to know a trick for that? What? It, yeah, sure. Flick yourself really, really hard when you learn someone's name the first time, and it'll be easier to remember. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, so they actually did studies on this. When I was, I worked at a company called Pavlock, and we were making a wearable device that shocks you to break bad habits. And yeah. there was a study that came out while I was working there where they did it with flashcards. And basically what they found out is if they administered a little bit of electric shock uh, on specific flashcards, you would remember those flashcards better, which kind of makes sense. Because if you're like walking you know, through a trail when you're like a hunter-gatherer and you get bit by a snake at a specific bend in the trail, then you're more likely to remember that bend, right? Because there's like a threat response. So you can kind of simulate that by flicking yourself or by snapping a rubber band against your skin. Huh. Sure. Okay. Anyway, but we, we, at the company, we experimented with this and we would have contests. We would go to networking events and we'd see how many names you could remember when you came back that night, which is really hard when you're at a networking event, like having cocktails or whatever. But we would come back and have like 33, 46 names remembered. And it was really, really remarkable. Of course, wow. practice helps. So. That's impressive. Okay. I will have to try that out the next time I'm in a, crowded place with a bunch of people i don't know yeah i can link to the, i'll link to the study in the show notes too so that other people can check this out so you've got this habit of asking why something is the way it is you're researching smart home technology are you building something um yes i am actually i wanted to add one more thing before i answer that question so what i was thinking about when i was thinking about augmented reality and what it could bring to us is really what we really want is locality of information I want to know that information as close to where it's useful to me as possible. So I, I want to reduce the barrier for me to get information. Um, and I think that's, that's really key to understanding. So, um, you know, so you can do uh, speech recognition and speech, speech th synthesis systems. That's one way to get information to you. Another way to get information is, um, through this augmented reality. Um, but it doesn't just have to be presenting the information. It can show you a lot of, a lot of things. So if you read a user manual that said, you know, to fix this thing, you need to put X in Y, you know, what if the system could, you know, highlight X in Y, um, you know, this way you would actually see where the location of the two items is. So bringing that information as close to where it's usable, you know, as close to where you need it, as you can to lower that barrier of entry. That's um, actually really interesting from a programming standpoint because I feel like a lot of documentation, I mean, so much technical documentation is just unclear or vague or bad and that would be really useful. Right, right. I mean, we, we experience this when we, um, like tool tips, when you hover your mouse over various things in a program that you haven't used before, there's usually a little pop-up box that tells you what it does um, and that's, you know, contextual information provided as close as it can be to, you know, where a feature that you're about to use. So, you know, I think augmented reality is a cool way of bringing that information as close to you as possible. And All right. So, how, what are you applying this to in your side project? Yeah. So the side project is um, creating a, a, a more, I don't know, a more efficient home, basically. So um, we're interested in how we can coordinate people's activities more effectively. Um, we're interested in educating people about their home and how to use appliances in their home. Um, so really bringing that information, uh, making the information available directly next to the object in your home that you might not know how to use or might not remember where you placed it. So what does this look like in practice? Like a meter that shows you how much energy you are using when you leave the lights on? Or? Hmm. Um, yeah, uh, well, so let's say, let's say for example, um, well, um, hmm. right. So, all right. So that's one form of smart home technology. So there's smart home technology around security, around lighting, um, so I'm interested in bringing information to objects in your home that you might not remember how to use or things you might not remember how to repair. Um, so let me, let me give, uh, let me give maybe 
in a, a more intuitive grounded example. So let's say, um, let's say you're, there's something wrong with your refrigerator, for example. So usually there aren't many smart refrigerators out there yet, but there's something with your, wrong with your refrigerator and you need to fix it. Um, so is there some way that I can teach you how to repair your refrigerator to both figure out what's wrong with your refrigerator as well as repair your refrigerator um, without you needing to hire some technician? Um, so, um, so it could be something as simple as replacing a clogged water filter or uh, replacing a light bulb. But is there some way to educate the homeowner about how to fix and maintain these appliances without them having to dig through a manual or hire someone to get the job done. Right. So AR in a lot of cases could be used to do like kinesthetic education programs, right? Because if you can see how something's done right in front of you as you're doing it, you can do it yourself and you can learn without having to, you know, read the manual, which again, technical documentation, not just for programming, but for like, Everything mm -hmm. is often really awful. You know, Zen in the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, he makes a great point of this where, cause he's a technical writer in the, you know, the main, the narrator is, and he, uh, he makes this great point that there's many, there's a huge variation between good technical writing and bad technical writing. And there is a lot of bad technical writing. So AR is becoming a big deal. VR, what do you think, what do you think is happening over there? Like, what are you, are you working on it? Do you have a headset at home? Uh, I, I do not have a headset at home. Um, have you tried it? I have I have tried it, yeah. I visited my uh, niece and nephew over the holidays and got to play with their latest game console. What did you uh, think? Uh, oh, it's, it's amazing. It's a lot of fun. Um, I think... Uh, I don't know. It's, it's, incredibly, it's an incredibly immersive experience to allow you to be lost in this world. Um, I haven't seen... I haven't seen any really compelling, interesting use of it yet. Um, so, and that I mean not just a game, but something that might educate you um, about how to do something. So I'm curious to see what are some you know, practical applications of virtual reality. Okay, so this is great because I spent the entire month of December, I, I bought a rig a gaming rig. I actually did what you said. I built my own computer, uh, computer, uh, so that I could have like really good video cards and, and, and processing power. Yeah. And I bought the HTC Vive and I've been using Unity and Unreal Engine to sort of just prototype things. And oh. I never really had a really good idea for what I wanted to build. So I was just playing around. But the other day it struck me that what I want is I want a virtual reality mind palace. Are you familiar oh. with the idea of a mind palace? Uh, so a way of organizing your thoughts with physical locations in a virtual world. Exactly. Wouldn't it be incredible if you had something that could train you to create a mind palace with real information so that way when you leave the virtual reality, you'd still have this model in your head of the space and of you know ways to sort of attach information spatially. I love it. It needs to be it. done. Someone, someone's going to do it. I, okay, here's a real problem in technology, David, and, and you can tell me what you think of it. I feel yeah. like if you come up with an idea while you're talking about the idea, somebody is already doing it. <laughs> um, yeah, well, there's definitely some truth in that. Like the, these ideas that we're talking about now, we are living in a time ripe for them. But, you know, 200 years ago, 400 years ago, of course, this all would all be unthinkable. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, don't, I, I help run a school that teaches students how to be creative and innovative. And it is difficult coming up with new and creative ideas that people haven't thought of before. Um, that is definitely true. You know, but keep trying. <laughs> Do you feel like it changes as you age at all? Like as you've gotten older, have you felt like your ability to grasp new technical concepts has changed, like become easier perhaps, or even become more difficult? Huh. Curious. I think it's, I think it has become easier for me to grasp technical concepts because I have a good um, breadth of understanding of a variety of technical concepts. So I, I mean, so it's curious the way humans think. I've yet to encounter an idea that's truly 
like a new way of thinking that I haven't thought of before. And I, and I attribute that to all the crazy experiences I've had growing up. Um, uh, no, crap, you know, I forgot the question completely already. <laughs> well, it's really, cause this is something that I, I think that, okay, so I'm 24 now. And, you know, if you read Jonathan Haidt, there's, he talks about there's this window of time from about 15 to 25 where you gain the most from the adversity that you overcome psychologically. And so I'm kind of coming to the end, end of that window and it's a little bit scary because I'm wondering, you know, am I going to not learn as much anymore? You know, am I not going to be as plastic from a neural standpoint. And so I wonder, you know, from your, cause you are obviously essentially where I want to be in terms of technical capabilities. Have you felt that way getting, you know, as you've gotten older, as you've graduated and kind of been working on different projects and been thinking about these different technical concepts? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, well, certainly one aspect of it is I'm, I'm finding myself getting settled in my ways. Um, so every once in a while, I have to be like, no, David, you need to try something new, think about it a different way, um, stew on it a little longer. Um, I mean, there definitely comes a point in which you figured out how to do a lot of things, and you can get pretty much everything you want to get done using all the techniques and approaches that you know of already. And so there is some comfort in that because you can get things done quickly because you have a good idea of how to do them. But it also means that you're not actively exploring for new techniques and new ideas for how to do things. Um, so I think that's, that's always challenging. So every time I jump on a new project, I always try to do some research to see what is out there, even if it's an area I've already worked in before, just because there are so many people out there in the world working on cool ideas. Things are constantly changing. And, um, I don't know. There's no other way to to be. There, there's no better way to be infused with these new ideas and new insights than just using the internet as a resource and seeing what's out there, or you know, even meeting, greeting, and talking to people like you. So let's talk about some of these experiences, some of these projects that you've worked on. I've got the F-35 sitting on this piece of paper in front of me, begging for me to ask you questions about it. So can you talk me through? I mean, the F-35 for anybody who hasn't paid attention to you know, military technology is like the most expensive thing ever built <laughs> or close, you know, at least from like a technology system standpoint. So walk me through it. What is the F-35? What was your role on it? Yeah. So, so well, when I was working on it, it was the X-35 is an experimental fighter. The F-35 is the newest and most expensive fighter out there. Um, it's known officially as the joint strike fighter. Um, it was the collaboration of several countries um, to create a multi-role jet fighter. So one that would not necessarily excel in any one area, but be capable of taking off vertical takeoff. So it could take off from a jungle. It could carry medium range missions and return back again. It was supposed to be this amazing jet fighter that would carry out a lot of the common operations that you would need a lot of different jet fighters to take care of nowadays. Um, Probably the, the the most interesting thing about the F-35 was it called for a lot of really cool advanced technologies um, that maybe not necessary, maybe a little bit ahead of their time. And so it ended up that the overall project was uh, really expensive and each plane is the, it's the most expensive fighter available. So not many of them are selling. And the ones that are are selling because the countries that I, well, I imagine the countries that participated in the this joint strike fighter project um, want to buy some of the planes that they put invested so much money in trying to design and make. So let me let me tell you my role in the company. Um, so as with any engineering project, um, there are many 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 people involved in the production of these things. So I played a small role in this. Um, so. I worked on the Joint Strike Fighters jet engines diagnostic system. So if that's enough qualifiers for you. And I did this at a company called Pratt & Whitney, um, which is located in Hartford, Connecticut. Um, so at the time when I was doing this, I was basically almost done with my undergraduate education at MIT, and I took this on as a summer internship. And it was the most bizarre summer internship I've had. I learned so much from it. 
Um, so lots of these advanced technologies we have nowadays, they're really complicated. There's a lot of moving parts that are all working together to make something, to make it operate. And that, and the Joint Strike Fighter is an incredibly complicated plane with a lot of moving parts that have to be thought through. My job in my job on the Joint Strike Fighter was to think through all of the possible faults that could happen um, on this plane. And so it was basically populating a database that would help predict possible ways the plane could fail. So um, let me give you an advice. It's never a great question to ask an engineer um, whether or not the thing they've built will fail because the first off-the-cuff response will be, nope, it won't fail because it was made not to fail that way. So it was a really interesting job because my job was to basically imagine all the different ways this plane could fail. So maybe if a sensor got stuck, maybe if the plane got shot, maybe if um, a, a oil hose ruptured somewhere, what would happen? How could we detect it? How could we repair it? And the Joint Strike Fighter had a really cool mandate on it, which is very envious, but also very difficult to achieve. They wanted um, for any accident that happened to, on the plane to be isolatable down to three inline replaceable parts. So what that means is, so a lot of things could break on these complex systems, but you don't you don't need to necessarily isolate the fault down to some chip somewhere on a board. Um, it's sufficient to isolate the problem down to like one of the uh, a, a board on the plane, like a circuit board or something like that, yeah. and to have it replaced. But isolating down to three possible components that you could replace to fix the problem is and was incredibly challenging. Um, so let me. So basically, what the day in life of this project was basically, um, I would basically collect from many, many of the engineers working on this project all their diagrams and their code for how the system worked. And I would look through all of it and try to memorize and learn as much as I could about how this plane works, and then try to come up with ways that it could possibly not work, and then describe the complex sequence of events, the chain reaction of events that would cause it not to work. And it was really interesting because you got to learn so much about a very complicated system and then you also got to use your imagination to see um, what could possibly fail. Um, what was really difficult about the job, though, is, as I said earlier, asking engineer how their what their baby, what the thing they worked on for years, will fail doesn't earn you a lot of friends. Um, so it was a fun and challenging job um, that uh, I don't know got helped me learn a lot, both about technology and interpersonal skills with how you interact with other people. Okay, so I, I, I have a follow-up question about the interpersonal skills, but I also have a question about just learning the complexity of such a gigantic system because in my experience working on software projects or hardware projects, it's a big challenge in joining a project is like creating a mental model of the systems and keeping it all in working memory and just understanding how it all fits together. Now, we're talking about probably the most complex system ever built. <laughs> I mean, this fighter jet's crazy, right? Like it costs probably billions, like billions and billions and billions of dollars. Oh, yeah. yeah. What, what did you learn? Like when you got there on day one, you know, you <laughs> knew nothing. What, what did the ramp up look like? What did you learn about the way that you learn? In, in the process of, of working on this thing. Yeah, well, it's, it's so right. It definitely took some time to understand how all the pieces fit together. So, um, you know, in software engineering, there's this term spiral, the, the spiral development cycle in which um, you never try to completely solve the problem in one go. You try to solve it to a point, and then you work on something else, and you work on something else. So at any given time, you have a working system, but it might not be 100% there. So I think a similar philosophy applied here. So I slowly learned how the plane operated just by looking at all the components of the engines and all the diagrams and things over and over and over again. You know, And eventually, I built up enough understanding of the overall um, concept of how things interacted that I could dive into pieces and then ask questions about how things worked. Um, was, yeah. there, was there a particular component or part of the system that you found like especially advanced compared to what people normally think about in terms of technology? 
Huh. Um, no, you know what? I'm going to answer that question in the exact opposite way. Um, so when it comes to when it comes to these really complicated systems, um, lots of people think that there's some super advanced technology on board, and occasionally there is. But a lot of the complexity doesn't necessarily come because of the advanced technologies. Um, it comes just because there's so many moving parts. Um, so the analogy I like to give here is actually let me diverge from talking about the Joint Strike Fighter for a moment. So talking about space missions. So imagine that you had to pay millions and millions and millions of dollars to launch uh, a new communication satellite into outer space. And so you have, I don't know, what, 20, 20 to 100 million dollars burning a hole in your pocket and you're going to go to some company and ask them to build you some satellite for you to relay communications across the globe. And that company is like, wow, that's fantastic. Um, this person in our company has this great new idea. We've never tried it before, but we want to try it on your product. Um, and you know, if it works, it'll be amazing, and your satellite will work even better than before. And if it doesn't work, there's a chance your satellite might not work or it might fall out of the sky. So if this is the risk proposition, then you know, if I'm going to put up $100 million for something or even $20 million, I am going to try to choose the most tried and true technology out there. So it's really interesting. A lot of the technologies that we create for space travel or these planes are actually some very simple, easy to understand technologies applied over and over and over and over and over again. So for example, on a lot of space systems and even planes, um, we use a very simple voting mechanism. So there's a lot of redundancies on these uh, planes and space systems to make sure they don't fail. But the way we decide whether a sensor is working or not is instead of just, you know, we have one sensor, we're just going to add another sensor, and we might even add a third sensor in the same spot. And if two of them look good and the third one looks bad, then we say the third sensor is probably at fault. If one of them you know, looks good and the other two look bad, then we say that one sensor is suspicious and it's probably the flow or whatever the sensor is measuring that's you know, problematic. So it's a very simple voting system, right? So there's these three sensors you're looking at and you're deciding based on you know, what they read, um, how they agree with each other, whether, some, whether they're reading correctly or reading incorrectly, whether the system is behaving well or not. So it's this simple concept that's applied over and over and over again. And it's kind of understanding how they interact that actually makes the system really complicated. Right. The redundancies in the system make it easier for you to isolate problems and sort of diagnose things. Right. So, okay. I want to turn to this interpersonal question that I wanted to ask you because you were saying that, you know, you didn't really make that many friends while you were working on the F-35. You strike me as a super happy, generous guy <laughs> is that intentional? Are you cultivating that as a practice? Have you always been that way? Talk to me about your disposition. I have I have always been a happy person. Um, I remember in elementary school we had a school carnival, and I would leave I would leave that carnival smiling so hard that my face would hurt for days to come. Um, so yes, I've always been that happy, smiley Asian guy. I don't like, if even if I'm feeling upset or stressed, I don't like to pollute other people with that emotion and drag other people down. So yeah, I always try to stay upbeat and positive. So when you are feeling stressed out or, you know, sad, you know, I, I think, I think, uh, you know, earlier when we were talking about kind of getting to the edge of your field where there is no one who knows more about it than you, I imagine that must be a lonely feeling in some sense. How do you deal with that? <laughs> Solidarity in the others that are working the same way you are, top of their field and um, working on some new interesting thing. I mean, so you there's all so if you're in this position, there's always some solace in the fact that what you're creating is bleeding edge and you know, that's incredibly, that's incredibly rewarding feeling. Um, you know, in my case, when I was working on my PhD, I was fortunately surrounded by many other graduate students also working on their masters or PhDs, also working on new and cutting edge technologies. So, you know, just like in, um, um, it, it, it's, uh, it's good to be surrounded by like-minded people with similar goals. And you can always, there's uh, emotional comfort 
and knowing that you're not the only one that's suffering through this. So, and I'm sure that you got a lot of this at MIT. I'd love to hear about, because now, and we're going to talk about New View uh, in a moment, but I, I want, I've had a few guests on the show who either skipped college or dropped out of college. And obviously everyone I'm interviewing is really good at what they do. So, but they had some pretty strong words about, you know, the situation with higher ed. And I have some strong opinions too. I really want to get your take on it because I think that you're kind of, the great example of how higher ed can really work wonders and really enable people. Can you talk to me about your experience and your philosophy? Um, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I did really well in the traditional education, education system. Um, I got straight A's. I was, um, I could easily memorize lots of facts. I had no problem listening to someone lecture at me for hours on ends on topics. And I realized this is all incredibly unusual. Um, but I learned a lot from it. So that was fine for me. Um, but what I've realized is as being an educator and working with students, um, you know, it's a very, we all say that everyone learns differently, but there really is a wealth of learning styles out there. And probably more importantly, a wealth of reasons why someone might want to learn something. And so discovering that reason that motivates someone to learn something, I think is interesting. And that's probably the most challenging part. So once you find that motivation, um, you can teach someone anything, really. But it's finding that motiv- finding that thing that motivates someone, that's that's hard. So can you give me an example? Obviously, nobody's names, but you must have students, you know, what does it look like to get to that breakthrough? Yeah, so I mean, it takes a lot of experimentation. It also takes um, an understanding of what the student likes and doesn't like. So, um, right, so I have an example in mind that's pretty old, four or five years old now. Um, There was a student that we had that... um, was a fantastic basketball player, was most likely going to go to college on some sort of basketball scholarship. And I really, really wanted him, since I'm really good at programming, to learn some programming. But um, I couldn't find a way to convince him that this was something useful. And it wasn't until, I didn't know he was a great basketball player until someone told me one day that he was a good basketball player. Um, So, the student in the course of his project proposed that he would create something that helps him improve his free throw skills. Um, and so we ended up taking a Microsoft Connect and, you know, pointing it to a, against a wall, setting up a hoop and having him take free throw shots. And the Connect did a very simple ball tracking thing and tracked the trajectory of the basketball and basically told him his release speed and the release angle of all of the shots and helped improve his free throw percentage. Um, so, you know, in, in creating this system, I had to sit there with him and kind of handhold him through the programming process. But what I really loved is at the end of it, he was like, I get it. Programming is so valuable. Um, and, you know, that, I really love that moment because it was something that he was dispassionate about before and afterwards, you know, I can't say that he went on to be some star programmer, but the fact that he appreciated what it could do, I think was really invaluable. Well, plus the project just sounds fascinating. I mean, that's probably technology that people in the NBA want to get their hands on. I'm I'm sure there are systems out there (laughs) like it that do the, that, that do something similar. At least I hope there is. I haven't looked. So Uh, you really excelled in the traditional education system. At least that's what what you told me. Do you is okay. We're going to get in a new view, but I'm I'm curious, like, do you think we're in a higher education bubble with the amount of student debt that we have and sort of people's outcomes? Do you see it as being the default? Is that a good thing? um, No, right. Okay. So no, I don't think it's a good thing. I think, people should really think through whether college is the right experience for them um, and exactly what they're getting out of college, how that will help them later on in life. So I think um, we've become kind of complacent 
and we've accepted that you know you go from elementary to middle to high school and then you go to college and you get a job and that's the path you have to take to be successful whatever your definition of successful is um, but it really doesn't have to be that way and I think there's an interesting question to ask as to what skills you pick up in college um, that you can't get through some other life experience um, so, what about at MIT? What do you think were the most critical things that MIT provided for you? And do you think that there are other ways that you could get that? Um, yeah, you know, very interesting. Um, so uh, do you know someone named Sean Stevens? I don't believe so. All right. So Sean Stevens was a former coach at, at New View. And it's just a really an amazing guy. Um, he... He applied to MIT. He, he, he was a local, he was a local Cantabrigian. He applied to MIT, didn't get in, and decided that was it. He was just going to learn everything himself. And I got to say, Sean, of all the people I ever knew, if I needed to get something done and I needed to get it done on the spot, Sean could figure out a way to do it. He had that, he had that MacGyver instinct that I don't think even I know. Like, you know, like, you know, with um, a stick of gum and some bailing wire, make a car. You know, that, <laughs> that type of expertise and understanding. And what I loved about him was he learned all of this stuff by himself. He learned like some basic electrical engineering skills, how to build things, um, manufacturing techniques by himself. And he and he created some amazing projects. Um, so you know, I don't think it's necessary that you go through some higher education. The real question is, what do you want to do with your life? Um, I think a lot of people nowadays uh, treat college as the time in which they figure out what they want to do with their life. But really, it's a question that you should really ask yourself during your entire life, what you want to do with it. And it's a question that I'm sure has many answers as we're growing up. Um, but it's not necessarily one that you discover when you're in college. It's one that you should evolve as you're growing up. So you went from this sort of pinnacle of higher education, uh, working in computer, or, you know, learning about computer science, AI. Now you are in the process of revolutionizing what middle, middle and high school looks like. What you know, made you take the leap? What was your cost benefit analysis? You could obviously be making a lot of money working at Boeing or, or DARPA or something. Um, why, why did you decide to do what you're doing now? Um, huh. There's a lot of different reasons. There's a lot of different reasons I did this. Um, so I think part of it is I really enjoy teaching. I think I said earlier, uh, when I was learning things, I really loved learning the intuition behind why something was. And I realized that I like teaching people because I like passing on that intuition. Um, and I really, really enjoy that sparkle when someone gets it, you know, when they take that intuition and then somehow it's easier to learn everything else. So one, I enjoy teaching. Um, the other part of it was um, I was confronted with an interesting truth. Um, Nuvi was co-founded by three people. Um, myself uh, and the two other co-founders, Saba Gole and Saida Rita, um, the, the, the thesis that New View is based around was actually written by Saida Rita. And kind of the way New View got started, I won't tell you, I'll tell you the short version of it, is um, I was working with Saeed on another project and he was finishing up his thesis and we were invited to give a dry run of his thesis presentation. And this was the first time I had ever seen it. Uh, we gave that dry run of that thesis presentation to the headmaster of an amazing local private school named Beaver Country Day. And um, he loved the idea so much, he really helped New View get its footing. He offered us a chance to pilot this, you know, groundbreaking, creative and innovative educational program at his school in an art classroom. Um, so... Um, what that made me realize was as, as we were working with those, that first batch of students 
Um, we were giving them chances to build things um, and to learn things in a very different order. So in a traditional education system, you know, you're, you're taught some foundational material and then you're taught the material that builds on top of that. And you're taught the material that builds on top of that. And you're basically promised that in the end, after all of this, you will be able to do something amazing. Um, at New View, we try to mix it up a little bit. We try to show you what the amazing thing is that you can do. Um, we try to teach you just a little bit of information to make you curious and I dare say maybe even a little bit dangerous and so that enough that you can dabble with it and you can create amazing things and that sparks interest and engagement to actually go back and learn all of that foundational material. And what I realized at MIT was I spent a lot of time learning all of this foundational material. And, you know, I know it incredibly well, and it's been incredibly valuable to know all of this stuff. But all the cool projects that I worked on at MIT was I don't necessarily I didn't necessarily do them at MIT in one of my classes. I did them because of some extracurricular activity, some club I found. It was a personal hobby I did on the side. Um, and so what I realized was really in order to have an impact, to do something really interesting that I loved, I had to find a way to do it myself instead of through the traditional education system. And I thought that was just a shame. And I realized in this process of doing these projects um, with these students that they really loved doing these projects and it really sparked their imagination. And I saw that as something that's missing in the traditional education system. So almost this routine way of building up from foundational subjects all the way to some lofty goal of knowing all of these things um, kind of robs people of that spark, um, robs lots of students of that spark, that curiosity. So talk to me, let, let's just jump into New View now. You got this pilot program. You had this model. Can you teach me about the model? Like, really, what does it mean to not have classes, to not have grades? Um, yeah. So, um, so the the model of education at New View we call the architectural model of education, um, which um, the, the fundamental level just means the student comes up with an idea, a project that they're working on. And then their ideas are pushed through the critique of an expert in whatever field the project is in. Um, so that at a very high level is what I would say the experience is like. But um, to describe it in probably a, a more understandable way, um, what we really want the students to do is come up with an amazing idea that they're passionate about. And so we try to teach our students how to take a good idea and make it a great idea and once they have that great idea, we try to teach them the skills to actually achieve that great idea. And so there's kind of two parts to this. Um, one part of it um, is how to come up with that great idea. So I think a lot of people have a misconception that you come up with that amazing idea for, I don't know, a flux capacitor because you're sitting in a bathtub and some bar of soap falls in your head and, you know, that's it. Like, that's how Isaac Newton discovered gravity, an apple falling on his head. But that's actually not the case. I think a lot of great ideas happen because we've thought about them for a very long time. Um, there's a lot of influences coming from the people we know and the experiences that we've had um, that actually drive to creating that great idea. And so the first thing we try to do is we try to teach the students how do you take some idea that you have and how do you research it, how do you ask the right questions um, how do you modify its design to make it something awesome? And then once you have this awesome idea, hopefully you think, hopefully the student would think it's awesome as well. So they have the passion, the enthusiasm to pursue it. And with that enthusiasm and drive, um, then we ask the question, what skills do you need to know to actually get this done? And in that sense, the student cares a lot more about learning those skills, whether that's the fundamental theory of electronics or basic geometry um, in order to build some piece of furniture. Um, they care about learning those skills so much more because now they're invested in this amazing idea that, you know, quite possibly no one has thought of before. So can you tell me what in your mind or what in the school's mind distinguishes a good idea from a great idea? Mm, that's interesting. Um, so, 
Um, so let me describe this in kind of a vacuous way, and then I'll describe it in um, one that's perhaps a little bit more measurable. Um, so um, from the world of architecture, from what from which we get this idea of critiquing the students and pushing them to come up with more and more creative ideas, um, we have this this word that of uh, sensibility that um, there is there you can create things and you can look at it and someone with a lot of expertise in the field has some implicit understanding that that object is made better or designed better than some other object. Um, now let me answer it in a little bit more grounded way. Um, so, well, so one, one way we evolve the students' ideas is we have these experts, fortunately, that help critique the students' ideas and push their ideas so they become great. Um, the more grounded way to explain it is we want the students to understand the concepts of design. And when you're, when you're designing something, you're not designing it for yourself necessarily, you're designing it for other people. And regardless of what you're designing, there's questions you can ask about how it serves the needs of others. So there's some big there's some big ideas that you can keep in mind. Um, so for example, um, let's see. Let's say you're um, let's say you are inventing a new way of um, uh, you know tricky. Now that I'm doing this, now that I'm trying to say this out loud, I'm having a hard time coming up with an example. Well, how about this? How about I'll, I'll throw you an idea and you can essentially, and it's, it's, you know, we work in the same field kind of like technology and, and we're sure. interested in hardware and software. So um, when we were talking about Internet of Things, um, I think that uh, everybody is wrong about what is going to happen in the future of Internet of Things, Okay. I don't believe that we're going to live in a world where everybody has, you know, smart refrigerators and smart toasters and internet connected tennis shoes. Like I, I think that that's a fad and it's going to quickly die out because it's impractical. I think the much more likely scenario is that we will have, isn't like at home personal robot drone type devices that do all the things for us. Okay, so if you have a drone that can, you know, that docks in your ceiling and then serves as a security camera, but it also can, you know, remind you of where you left the remote or it can turn off the oven if you left it on or it can like let your dog out to go to the bathroom while you're at work. I think that having one device that can do a lot of things, kind of like a little F35 in your house, is mm -hmm. a much more likely scenario for how uh, we're going to use like developments in machine vision and robotics and battery life to enhance your at home life. What, what do you think of this sort of like, you know, uh, centralized, uh, intelligent robot idea? Um, yeah. So I have a, a couple of different ways, a couple of different ways of looking at that. So, um, so you mentioned something that's actually really important, which is this issue of power. Um, so getting energy to all of these devices that consume it is a big problem that we have now. Um, so imagining that we have all of these little separate devices that you know are all magically connected to the internet and are all drawing power is really difficult for me to imagine because I have a hard time remembering to charge my phone. You know, for example, so what's going to happen if I have to charge all of the separate stuff? So, um, yeah, I think you have a pretty good strong thesis in that um, a personal assistant in which it's, you know, one machine that's capable of doing a lot of different things. I think there's something really reasonable in that. Um, so how I might drive this idea forward is let's just let's just take for a moment. Let's just believe um, that that personal assistant robot is actually what you want to create. Um, now the question is, what would you have that personal assistant robot do? So I'm going to ask the question, um, so what are some common problems that you would that you want that personal assistant robot to solve? And so, for example, the student might answer like, well, I want it to like make breakfast for me in the morning. Mm -hmm. Or I want it to, uh, they, they might come up with some really grandiose stuff. I want it to make breakfast for me in the morning. I want it to make my bed. I want it to do my homework. Um, I want it to tell me that, you know, I'm missing something when I leave the house, you know, so then, so these are all wonderful, 
grand ideas, and I'm sure at some point in the future we will be there. But then for each one of these statements, we can break it apart. So, you know, why exactly do you want the robot to make you breakfast? Is it because, you know, it's too difficult for you to do it yourself? Um, really what's, what's involved in that, in that process that makes it difficult for you to do. So perhaps the robot can do some more specific tasks that you find really difficult to do in the morning. So maybe it's the fact that you wake up in the morning and you're incredibly sluggish and slow. So your hand eye coordination isn't good. So it's difficult for you to like butter your bread or get something out of the refrigerator. So maybe the robot can do that specific task. Maybe it doesn't have to do the entire end to end chore you know, making your, your breakfast and then bring it to you in bed. Um, so picking apart, um, picking apart the, you know, these grand idea statements and then trying to pick out the components that are reasonable and achievable and trying to formulate a new idea out of them. Um, that's what I try to do. Right. Because if some, if one of your students comes to you with this idea, it's obviously not feasible for, I mean, this isn't even feasible for like Boeing to work on right now, right? It's such a big challenge. So you're saying, hey, let's break it down to like one thing that we might actually be able to solve and that we can kind of wrap our head around the component parts to learn the skills necessary. Right. Okay. So you might say, right, like making R2D2 is not feasible, but making like a robot that butters toast is totally doable in one semester. Right. Awesome. Right. You know, so, or, yeah, and, and I know there's a lot of different ways to push this ideas. So I imagine a personal assistant could also help you locate things in your house. It doesn't have to touch them. It just needs to find them and tell you that it's home. You know, so sometimes I leave the house and I forget something at home and I, I don't need the robot to bring it to me. That would be awesome. Really what I want to know is where the heck did I leave it? Did I lose it somewhere or is it in a safe spot? You know, that a robot could totally do for me. Um, so it's it's about asking these questions to pick apart the ideas, to get at some kernel that's interesting, it's achievable. Um, that's kind of what's difficult about driving an idea to be a great idea. I, I In my own experience, I have found myself coming up with many of these grandiose ideas, and it wasn't until I got older and more mature and more familiar with the technology that I realized there is sort of a minimal viable product that has to get built in order for this grand idea down the road to ever get built. And so it, I guess that learning about the complexity is a major part of the education that you're trying to impart. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, there's, there's another aspect of it that I should probably also mention, which is um, once you have that amazing idea in mind, um, how do you not lose sight of it? Um, so let's say you have this amazing idea for um, some flying aerial robot. Um, is it really the flying aerial robot that matters? Does it really matter that it flies? What is that the core idea that you don't want to get rid of? Is it the fact that the robot can, maybe it doesn't need to fly, maybe it's that the robot really just needs to get anywhere in your house. And so, you know, maybe the technology you need is not flight. Maybe driving around is just fine. So extracting the core of the idea that you actually want to go for is really important and also not losing sight of it. So something that I experience a lot with um, the students is, you know, they'll come across a technological hurdle and they'll be like, oh, now there's no way to solve it. What, that great idea I had of a flying drone, it's just impossible. So, you know, this idea of locating things in the house with a flying drone, that's just not going to happen anymore. And so that's the end of the project. But, you know, is it really important that the drone flies, you know, to make them revisit their idea, question it, and to extract the core part of it that's interesting, and to make sure that, you know, the idea stays on track despite the road bumps that come along the way. And this is, this is, I love this example too, because you, you just made me think of it. Cause I've kind of had this vision in my head for a little while, but it's like, I've always known that it's, uh, not feasible right now, but you could essentially attach a robotic arm to a track on your ceiling. And if it could reach down, you know, to the floor and, you know, fold up in like an accordion style, you could, I mean, you don't need a battery for the drone cause it's hooked into the track and you don't need anything to fly, which is super, um, well, you know, we're getting the hang of automated flight, but 
you know, it solves so many problems if you can just look at it a different way. Yeah, I mean, another reason I might not want automated flight in my house is uh, those quadcopters produce a lot of downdraft and will blow my papers and stuff everywhere. Yeah, and they're noisy. Yeah, and they're and they're incredibly noisy. Yeah, yeah so potentially there's another solution there. Yeah, I love the idea of smart homes. I would love to start. I, mean, I, I think that there's a lot of really interesting things that we're going to be doing here in the near future. But I, I do want to hear uh, more about NewView. I want to hear, like, what are some cool projects that your students have been working on recently? What would a parent who's sending their kid there, you know, next semester expect? Oh, all right. So many cool projects. Um, so, well, so I, I should I should mention. So, so at NewView, the, the logistically kind of how we have the the our time divided is our students usually spend about two to three weeks, um, solid five hours a day. So from nine to three p.m. and an hour for lunch. They they have their entire day focused on working on a particular design challenge or problem, some sort of prompt. Um, and so they basically go through NewView in these two to three week chunks. And every one of these chunks we call a studio. Um, and the stu each studio poses a new design prompt or challenge. And the students are exposed to all sorts of different problems. Um, so I've posed very, um, I don't know, engineering type problems before. So I've asked the students to design cool new planes um, that maybe look like an animal or do something interesting. Um, so that's one type of studio that we've done. We've done other studios around painting murals around Cambridge. Um, so we have this amazing mural in Central Square here in Cambridge that um, that is called Belonging that uh, shows the cultural diversity and heritage inherent to this area of Cambridge um, that I think is fantastic. And the students had to explore, you know, what are all the cultures around here? Um, how are they distributed around Cambridge? And what are some of the colors and textures of all these various cultures and how to incorporate them in a mural? Um, we have worked on uh, the refugee crisis. Um, so um, how refugees are handled across the world, what are different ways to help them out? Um, we've worked on lots of projects revolving around disability. Um, so how to help people in wheelchairs or missing a, a limb do something, um, do something in particular. So one of the most recent studios we had is with uh, an amazing dance company in New York called Heidi Latsky Dance Company. And um, the students created these outfits for these dancers with disabilities um, that both um, that both expressed some personal trait that the person really cared about, um, as well as um, uh, I don't know, really accentuated their dance movements. And of course, their dance movements are choreographed around the disabilities that they have. So there's something really interesting about these fashionable outfit pieces. Um, so we really cover these design challenges um, from a whole uh, variety of disciplines. And so another way to say it is we try to teach creativity and this idea of evolving an idea that you can ask questions, you can ask uh, questions in all of these to evolve an idea, regardless of that idea is a painting, is a mural, is something of very technical. Um, there's a way to get it from a good idea to a great idea and then to learn the skills needed to accomplish it. So I want to segue a little bit here into sort of returning to your origin story. Let's say I want to start a school. I want to start a private school like New View. Mm -hmm. How do I do it? How do I do it on the cheap? <laughs> <laughs> huh. Interesting. Um, well, there's a lot of different ways to, of going about starting school. Um, you could start a charter school. Um, you could start um, a homeschool type program. Uh, or you could start a school like NewView, which is kind of in between all of these. We are not a charter school, so we receive no public funding in that sense. Um, we are more like a private school, except for we are also not accredited. Um, so NewView is a private educational business. Um, so, um, there are some questions you can ask about what type of school you're trying to create. Mm -hmm. um, so does that avoid a lot of the, I, I guess, what is the difference? Do you, do, do students get a diploma when they graduate? What does it mean if you're not accredited and you're a private educational business? Uh, that sounds like it might be the easiest way from like a regulatory standpoint to get started. 
Yeah, from a regular from a regulatory standpoint, it certainly is. Um, but kind of the 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 question is really how important is that accreditation process? Um, so to be accredited means you're teaching a certain skill set that someone has prescribed that the students should learn at, ahead of time. So unfortunate to say, um, a lot of colleges still look for that accredited diploma. Um, so they're looking for a particular coursework. Probably the good thing to say is there are more and more colleges that are starting to look at portfolios of work, um, are trying to understand students more holistically other than just looking at their, their grades on English and science and history or whatnot. Um, and you must have relationships established with some of these schools in order to sort of be a source for students who want to enroll, right? We we do. So um, so I think an, an important thing in creating a school is envisioning what success looks like for the student after they leave your school. Um, so really, what are you teaching them to do later on and later on? So is the purpose of the school to teach them how to get into a good college? Um, is it to teach them fundamental life skills to perform well as, as in a job? You know, is it to teach them to become the future innovators and creators and entrepreneurs of the world? You know, what exactly is success for a student that leaves your school? Um, you know, for, for New View, uh, we like to think that our students, um, will become those amazing innovators of the future that come up with these amazing ideas, um, that they learn a lot of the team working skills, often called soft skills, that people need in order to operate effectively in a company. Um, these are skills that you don't necessarily pick up just because you go to college and sit in lecture halls and, you know, are taught theories about various things. These are things you learn because you've worked on compl complicated projects with uh, fellow classmates or fellow employees. So these are the skills that we try to impart at New View. Um, I so would love to dive into this because I think that the intentional cultivation of interpersonal skills, conversation skills, soft skills like you mentioned is incredibly important, at least in my career it certainly has been. Are there any sort of models that you look to like nonviolent communication or uh, DIFCON for the foundation there is there any ways that you practice it with the students so what practice sorry can you ask the question again is are there any well a are there any models that you're looking at in terms of communication styles or models that tell you how to communicate effectively a and how do you take those models and translate them into practice and intentional development at the school very interesting. Um, so um, as to looking for a specific formal model, um, we don't teach a specific formal model. Um, but uh, so I, I have a way of teaching the students how to communicate that I found pretty effective. Um, and I can give you kind of an anecdotal story of a recent experience that that I've had and actually one that I, I have quite often. Um, so I think all of us are all we're usually pretty good at working by ourselves, but working in a team can be a really big challenge. I have a group of students now that are working on a really cool project called Smile Shade that's supposed to help with seasonal effectiveness disorder. Mm. Uh, uh, so, and it's really interesting. There's four students on the project. They're each incredible students working in their, they have their own specializations. They're each really good at these particular skills. Um, and, you know, a lot of times I find them working by themselves um, on their tasks. And every once in a while, you know, I try to force them to communicate with each other. And they it took a really long time for them to understand why it was important for them to communicate with each other. And one of the first complaints that I got was um, so-and-so, one of the students complained to me that another one of the students um, felt like they were above them, like they were, they were their boss. You know, and so I asked, you know, why do you feel that way? And they're like, because that other person just keeps telling me that I need to, you know, meet these deadlines and I need to get this thing done. And I'm like, oh, great. What did you say back? I said, no, I can't meet that deadline. And then I went back to working. <laughs> 
so I thought it was a, just a really interesting interaction, um, you know, because so basically one of the student's job is to try to maintain a work schedule for everyone else um, to try to keep everyone on task and on schedule. And the other students interpreted that as that was the role of the boss and therefore the boss was more important than all of them. Right. But it's, you know, it's really interesting because the, the person that's maintaining that schedule, you know, doesn't necessarily have the uh, CAD skills that one of the other students has, doesn't necessarily have the electrical engineering skills of the other student, the programming skills of the other one. So it's not like one person's above the other one. They each have an important role to play. Um, so the way I like to explain this to my students is, look, each one of you are incredibly smart. Each one of you has brains. Um, but when you work in a team like this, we're trying to create one massive brain. Unfortunately, humans don't have the ability to grow neurons between our heads yet. And so we have to resort to primitive forms of communication like talking and writing. And unfortunately, talking and writing are just not quite as good at expressing what we're feeling, what we're thinking, as if, if we could like Vulcan mind meld with each other. Um, so yeah, there's going to be a lot of meetings and you have to talk. You can't just say, no, I'm not doing that right now and just assume the other person, you know, knows what you're working on or why what you're working on is so important. You have to say it. Um, so I express this idea to the students a lot that, you know, working in teams really requires this level of communication and your objective is to create one epic massive brain. And just unfortunately, um, the only communication channels that you have are, drawing pictures, writing, or, you know, so given that, what can you do to communicate with each other? Um, so I love this idea that we're becoming a giant brain. I actually was listening to Peter Diamand is essentially echo the same idea, but on like glo a global scale earlier today. Um, I, there's also research around this, how, you know, the best performing teams communicate the most and, have sort of the most equal distribution of communication amongst members. So there's definitely a lot of interesting research uh, to be done in this space. And I, I can assure you and anybody listening, and I'm sure that you will echo this, is that communication is absolutely critical to a team's success. So I'm really glad that you're working on that with your students. <laughs> Let me continue i, I want to dive into the the school a little bit more can you tell me about the specific project though uh, the seasonal affective disorder what, what is the solution because i know that i get a little bit down in the winter time especially when it's gray like it is today uh, so I, I can tell you a little bit about it but the students are pretty excited to get their idea um on the market so Ooh. can't tell you too much about it the okay. the, the, the gist of it is um, right now seasonal affective disorder is most commonly treated by antidepressants, drugs, or um, a, a light therapy from a light box. And it is br pretty much just a really bright lamp that produces a very specific color spectrum of light at a given intensity, and you just sit next to it for a given amount of time. Um, the research on why this is effective um, varies. Um, some people say it's the light hitting your skin. Other research studies say it's the light that enters your eyes. So it's not exactly clear. But what is clear is that people that do receive this light treatment it say they, it really helps their um, SAD. So, um, so there's that basic idea of using that light box. But then, you know, using a light box, it feels like you know you're you are receiving some sort of treatment wouldn't it be so much better if you could get that light from a window to make it feel like it was natural sunlight pouring through the window um oh my goodness <laughs> i love it i'm gonna buy one please get it on the market i will buy one i'll buy several for my product. i will i will i will let you know about it yeah awesome uh, so yeah, I mean, that's the fundamental idea. So can we create something that you can mount on the wall or over a window that helps you not only control when light is entering, but also itself produce light as if it were natural sunlight seeping through a window. So instead of making you feel like you're obligated to receive this, this recommended medical treatment, to make it feel like you're naturally getting the sunlight that's recommended. Yeah, well, the best technology kind of disappears, doesn't it? It's not even, you don't even know it's there if in an right. ideal world. So. Right, right. 
I have a couple of, you know, administrative questions here. You know, w- you know, there's a parent listening. They want to send their kid to New View. What does that process look like? Who do they talk to? What is the tuition cost, et cetera? Yeah. All right. So um, it depends. So right now, New View has students uh, from kind of two walks of life. Um, some of our students come from local public and private schools and they come to us for a fixed period of time. We've already arranged with these schools and the course counselors in the schools what it means for the student to leave their, um, their we, we call them their parent school, and come to New View for a period of time. And so really that means rearranging their coursework to make sure they don't miss all of that accredited coursework. Um, we have some other students that are homeschooled or maybe not even homeschooled and just come to us full time. Um, uh, or are possibly taking a gap year, for example, between middle school and high school. Um, and these are kind of two different routes to come to us. Um, so we're partnered with a lot of schools around here, but if your student is interested in coming to New View, probably the best way to go about it is just to come talk to us. Do you plan on scaling the model? Um, yeah, so that's actually something we are working on. Um, but it's it's uh we're we're right so we're we explored scaling the model in a lot of different ways so one way we thought about scaling the model was just opening new physical new view centers around here uh, just around the cambridge boston area um but the way we're thinking about it now is we want to have we really think this idea of making students excited about their ideas and learning as a result of that excitement we think that's invaluable we really want to get that idea out there. So um, the new approach we're taking is to help um, existing private and public schools establish a program, a class um, in their school, an innovation class um, that basically helps teach the way we teach, but on the campuses of these schools. Um, so we're trying to grow and we're trying to grow that way. So that's really exciting to me because you know, I didn't. I didn't want to hurt your feelings, but I feel like Boston is a little bit spoiled when it comes to education, and a city like Baltimore, for example, would really benefit from having some progressive thinkers in the education space. And is there any, you know, way or timeline for you in terms of expanding across cities? Uh, if you're asking in particular for Baltimore, I'm not sure. Um, I'm, but, fr- I'm from Maryland, that's why I asked. Ah, got it, yeah. got it. Um, so, I mean, if you know the school there that's interested, we would absolutely love to hear from them. Um, there's actually a really interesting problem that we've noticed. Um, so I'm sure a lot of, I'm sure you and a lot of your listeners have heard about makerspaces. Mm-hmm. And makerspaces have been a buzz for quite a while now. Um, something that a problem that often presented to us, a lot of schools have maker spaces, but they are being underutilized. Um, so the students that use them already are passionate about making things. The students that don't use that, you know, aren't interested in using them or don't use them to begin with, just don't ever get back to using it. And we've also heard about other use of makerspace classes like, um, um, like running an English class in the makerspace and the students are all taught how to laser cut their poem um, into wooden board. Mm. You know, so that's a, that is a way to use a makerspace, but it's not the most interesting way you can use the makerspace. You know, that's that's not really a good combination of English and making. It's very prescriptive. Um, it's very prescriptive and making something doesn't necessarily enforce learning anything about English. You know, so it would it would be maybe more interesting to make a set of blocks with words on them that you could compose to create Shakespearean sonnets, for example. Maybe that would teach you some structure about how, um, you know, the phraseology and the wording of the time was used. Um, you know, that would be an interesting combination between English and a makerspace. So um, we also help talk to schools about how they can use their makerspace more effectively. And right now, um, what we'd really like to do is help schools use their makerspace more effectively by infecting them with the creativity and innovation that we teach our students. Well, that just sounds tremendous. And I really hope that there is somebody out there listening that either works for some educational institution 
that is going to reach out to you and hopefully help you scale this model because I think that it's extremely effective. Uh, I want to be respectful of your time. Where can my listeners find you? And do you have an ask for the audience, anything that you want them to do or take with them as they go about their day? Ah, interesting. Um, so the, well, the best way to find us is to visit us at our website um, at newviewstudio.com. Um, so you, if you type in newviewstudio.com, you'll be redirected to our Cambridge location, cambridge.newviewstudio.com. Um, you can explore all the projects our students have done there. And actually, I encourage you to explore those projects. There's a lot of amazing ideas um, produced by our students there. There's also a description about the logistics for how our school is run, as well as contact information for our faculty and staff if you're interested in coming to New View, or if you're interested in teaching at New View, or just coming to check it out. Um, we would love to have you come. Um, one of our favorite things as New View is when we have um, visitors come in and they um, roam around the classrooms and ask students about their ideas. Um, that really impresses upon the students that this is not just an academic exercise, that people care about their ideas. Um, so if you are, if you find yourself in the Cambridge area, um, the ask is I would love for you guys to drop by New View. Well, I guess drop us an email first, let us know when you're available, and we'll schedule a time for you to come by and uh, chat with us and chat with our students. Um, the other ask I would have for um, the audience is um, I think I would ask yourself, what does success mean to you? And whether or not you believe college is critical on that path to success. Um, so I, you know, I think there's all sorts of different answers out there for this, but we're living in a world in which education is evolving, that has been stagnant for a few hundred years and it's changing. And I think it's important for all of us to ask that question. What exactly does it mean to be successful and what do we actually have to learn to get there? Awesome. David Wang from New View, the revolutionary new school coming out of Cambridge, Massachusetts. Thank you so much for your time today, David. And I will link to New View and all of the resources and things that we mentioned during our conversation today in the show notes. Thank you, David. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, a couple more things before you go. If you enjoyed today's episode of Hacker Practice with David Wang, please hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening to get the next season of episodes when they become available. Also, leave us a review on iTunes. Those reviews help us climb the charts so that more folks can find this podcast and listen to these interviews. Thirdly, if you didn't like the episode for whatever reason, or even if you did and you just want to say hi, leave us some feedback at hackerpractice.com. There's a form on the homepage. That's hackerpractice.com. We really look forward to feedback, and I read and respond to every piece of feedback personally. So go to hackerpractice.com, leave us a note, hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening, and please, please, please leave us a review on iTunes. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for listening, and we hope you enjoyed today's episode of Hacker Practice with David Wang.